So my name is Sanjay Rao. I've been with Red Hat uh, for almost eight and a half years now. Uh, my background was all systems administration, database administration, uh, working with leg legacy large storage. I used to work for Compaq, HP. And so we used to work with large storage pools. I mean, imagine what today we have, a terabyte drive that you can go to Best Buy and pick up for less than 100 bucks. And we used to have rows of storage uh, just to build one terabyte of storage. So uh, those were you know, different days. And now we live in a completely different world, different challenges uh, in how we run our applications, our databases. Um, and uh, as we go through today's uh, talk, I'll talk about the various things that we do uh, in order to proactively try and tune your systems to run databases. OK, let me get the mouse. There it is. All right. So uh, the objectives of this session is to uh, take a look at the various aspects of tuning. Uh, we will discuss certain tuning parameters, uh, as well as it's all over the place. Uh, we, will, we will see the results of the tuning. Uh, some of, most of it is uh, on bare metal, but in the end, I'll also share some results from the KVM, uh, uh, running databases in KVM. And uh, mainly because Oracle, uh, show of hands, how many people run Oracle on Red Hat Enterprise Linux? There you go. Yeah, it's been pretty much the same case for many years, so that is why uh, I will also share some Oracle database tuning considerations uh, as part of this presentation. And then I'll touch upon some of the tools that I use to do the measurements. Uh, this slide I put in here just because, you know, I mean, uh, people who have chosen Red Hat have chosen it for a reason. Open source, speed of innovation, uh, and uh, and not just the speed of innovation, the, the type of innovation that goes into it. I mean, virtualization, pretty much uh, everywhere Red Hat has been, um, you know, starting from Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, we included virtualization, and but there have been so many innovations. And the reason why I'm including this here is because of all these innovations, because of all the scalability that we are trying to build into the platform, there are so many different uh, things that we put into the software which can actually change the whole tuning outlook as we move from release to release. So uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, as we are working on the open hybrid cloud and uh, uh, there are features that we are building into the OS to facilitate NUMA tuning and things like that, which can actually affect your database performance. You will see as we go forward. Uh, all of it is now 64-bit. So to run your databases, you have to install 32-bit libraries. Um, so tuning consideration. So let's start off by uh, looking at, uh, we, will, we will break it down into these four components, uh, but mainly we will talk a lot about I.O. As you guys know that I.O. is actually one of the biggest uh, factors in how your database performs. So uh, we will break it down by components like that and, uh, uh, and discuss it by each component. So how many people have now used TuneD? Show of hands, please. There you go. So uh, most of you, most of the people here are. Sorry. So most of the people here are familiar with TuneD, uh, and we have actually enhanced that whole infrastructure in RHEL 7. For those who are not familiar or have not used it, it is a framework that we've created to facilitate tuning. So when you apply a TuneD profile, we, we define TuneD as a, a number of profiles built into that infrastructure. So when you apply a profile, it'll go ahead and modify certain system parameters that will help your workload to run faster. And the, how you choose your profile is based on what you run as a workload. Um, one of the main things in RHEL 6 was we would start off with our default values uh, in, for the system parameters, and then we would ask you to enable TuneD and turn on the profile. In RHEL 7, it's already there, and one big difference is uh, the default profile is throughput performance. So right off the bat, when you install RHEL 7, you get deadline elevators. I mean, there are a variety of things which you'll see uh, in the chart. But uh, those, those parameters are already built in. Then throughput performance is enabled by default. Uh, one of the really good things about TuneD is while you're running these applications, and uh, let's assume we start off with throughput performance, and you look at the number of different profiles that you have, and you say, oh, I want to try a different profile to see how my application behaves. You can actually apply the profile. All the, all the tunables are applied dynamically, and you should be able to see the effect right away. And if you don't like what you see, you can roll it right back. So that's one of the things uh, that's really uh, good about TuneD. It goes back. 
All right. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out is uh, in the REL6 days, I shared the different directories where we have the TuneD ecosystem built. So you can actually customize your own profile. We typically tell you not to uh, go modify the existing profiles because that can create confusion. Because now on one system, you may have a completely different profile with the same name, which differs from other systems, right? So uh, you want to let the profiles that we provide as part of TuneD to stay where they are, and you can actually create your own custom profile uh, based on your requirements. Uh, it's this file that you go and change in case you want to do it. And what we did was even to put more structure into TuneD, we actually added the concept of inheritance. So people who work with HTTP.com type files, you know that you know if you take, it starts with a base profile and then things are added. So just to give you a quick example, we have a balanced profile, but this is the default profile, as I mentioned earlier, uh, throughput performance. And these are the various parameters that it modifies. Um, and we have network throughput, performance, uh, throughput profile, which actually is like, just, uh, just like I mentioned, it inherits all the settings from throughput performance. And in addition to that, it adds these three values. So it's very easy when you, when you take these files and you say, I want to see what, what it changed in my system you just look at this chart, or you go look at that TuneD con file that I showed in the previous slide, and you should know exactly what was changed and what facilitated performance. And you can roll it back one at a time also if you wanted to do more investigation. And similarly, we have a profile called latency performance. Uh, and basically, it's meant for low latency type applications where you really, latency matters for uh, your application. And we have, in addition to that, network latency profile that inherits from that and adds these few parameters. We have also, as I mentioned, RHEL 7 is a, a cloud operating system. So uh, we have created profiles for virtual host and virtual guest. And they both inherit from throughput performance and add these few parameters uh, in addition to that. Just to give you a list of existing profiles that we provide with TuneD, you can see the list of the different profiles. Uh, this is our default. And as you can see, now more ISVs are also starting to get on board. They realize that you know, there are certain things that their application requires as far as kernel parameters are concerned. They are contributing. They're going online and then putting, uh, you know, going into the open source project and putting in their own TuneD profile. So we are hoping that more and more people sign on and facilitate creation of these TuneD profiles so you can apply the profile when you want to run SAP, for example. All right, so let's now get down to actual tuning. Uh, with the TuneD profile, I did a quick comparison on this box uh, where I was running with the default profile of throughput performance. And what I realized was my CPUs were not running at the highest speed. Uh, so I applied the latency profile in this one because all the other I.O. parameters were exactly the same. But when I applied the latency profile, it cranked up my CPU speed to the maximum. And I was able to get a nice little jump in performance. So the blue bar, which is the latency profile, uh, it shows the green arrow indicates that uh, higher is better, and you can see across the board, I get about a 10% improvement in performance. One of the things you have to remember when you apply these profiles, you look at what it changes, and in this case, as, as I mentioned, latency profile actually modified my CPUs to run at the highest frequency, but in order to do that, also make sure your BIOS is con configured properly. So you may apply this profile, and you may not see a difference at all, and that may be because your BIOS is set to you know, not, uh, so there are different modes in the BIOS. So you'll have to, if you want to run in the highest possible uh, frequency mode, you have to go and change your BIOS to let the OS control the frequency of the CPUs. So that was TuneD. So it, it's really effortless to go ahead and change the profiles and apply the changes and, and get the benefits of performance improvements right away. Uh, when it comes to I.O. tuning, uh, there are different uh, uh, I.O. You know, subsystems that you can buy. So you can start off with SAS or SARA. Uh, we've got fiber channel, Ethernet. And now we also have uh, SSDs. So one of the key things I always point out to customers is we actually ran into a situation where uh, they had a 10 gig Ethernet, but they were not getting more than 600 or 650 megs per second, even driving it you know, with, with different uh, network utility tools. And what we realized was, I mean, I told them to give me an output of LSPCI, and they had it put in a, le a legacy PCI slot. So make sure when you buy uh, new equipment, some of most, many of the systems actually have legacy PCI slots for backward support, backward compatibility. Make sure that if you're buying a very high-speed high type uh, PCI device, it goes into the right slot. 
the other thing is we have multipath. Uh, when you move from operating, operating system to operating system, release six to release seven, for example, make sure that you check the vendor recommendations because uh, the way multipathing worked in rel six uh, was very different uh, from the way it works in rel seven. You know, I mean, so. Uh, the difference between rel 6 and rel 7 is not as significant as it was in rel 5 and rel 6 in rel 5 uh, it did not do a lot of io aggregation so you had to define how many uh, min io round robin min ios you wanted uh, per path in rel 6 it does a very good uh, it does a great job of aggregating io so now in rel 6 for most uh, large uh, storage subsystems you can actually have a rr min io of 1 so if you have a bigger value in there you're basically saturating one path and not making use of all the different paths in your multipath. So this is something that uh, the vendors actually update the multipath.conf. So do not carry forward your multipath.com from rel5 to rel6 when you're moving from release to release. Make sure that you start off with the default values and then look it up, uh, talk to your vendors, and, and that's, otherwise you can see up to a 20% difference in performance uh, if, if it is misconfigured. Uh, what I typically do when I try to run my database or when I'm trying to establish a new platform in order to run my database is I do some low-level I.O. testing, you know, using tools like DD, I.O. Zone, DT, or FIO. And I try to mimic the behavior of my database. So when I'm running my database in a production environment, I try to capture the uh, I.O. statistics by using a tool called I.O. Stat. In fact, uh, I'll have the command in a, in a couple of slides. So I use that IOSTAT tool, and I look at the request size and the queue depths, and I try to mimic that behavior. If I'm going to implement my database in a newer storage uh, subsystem, for example, I'll run that same test and figure out if the storage system is able to deliver you know, the bandwidth that I'm looking for when I'm trying to implement a new system. Uh, just to understand IO elevators, although now with our throughput performance uh, profile, you really don't have to touch these I.O. elevators, but there might be certain applications that might require a little bit of tweaking. Uh, we, we support three different elevators in RHEL 7, Deadline, CFQ, and NOOP. And what I've done is I've kind of explained what, what each one of them do. Uh, Deadline has two queues per device, one for read and one for write, and I.O.s are dispatched based on the time they spend in the queue. Uh, this is great for multi-process applications like databases. Because now, you know, all the requests, your databases are mainly interrupt-based. Uh, when, when you put in a request for, you know, you're locking up a table and you're doing an update and things like that. And if you keep those IOs waiting in a, in a queue, that can really disrupt uh, and, and have a very serious impact on performance. So having deadline for your database application is, is ideal, uh, uh, which gets set with, uh, with the TuneD profile. But in case you're not doing that, uh, this is the elevator of choice for running databases, and like I mentioned here. Uh, CFQ used to be our default in RHEL 6, but with RHEL 7, we've actually switched to deadline, so you don't have to really worry about uh, you know, uh, whether it's set to deadline or not. But if you're still on RHEL 6, this is something that you definitely want to go take a look. Uh, CFQ is mainly uh, for root file system, where you, you, if, if somebody issues a ton of IOs, and if your root process wants to get in there and do something, and it finds itself you know, sitting at the end of a long queue, uh, that can really bring a system to its knees. So that is the reason why CFQ was uh, designed. So it gives equal priority to all processes, so everybody gets a chance to complete their I.O. So in, in, in situations like that, it really helps. But for databases, uh, it's definitely not the elevator of choice. And uh, NoOp is uh, very, very similar to Deadline, that it's a first in, first out. It does very simple I.O. merging and very low CPU cost. It's ideal for using uh, solid state devices, which is kind of becoming the norm now. Uh, how do you configure IO elevators? So if you wanted to do it for individual devices, so if you have a mixed environment where, you, where you've got a bunch of uh, fiber channel devices and you've got one SSD and you'd like to uh, have no op elevator for that, you can actually echo the value of the elevator you choose to that device. So here I'm updating the scheduler or the elevator for SDA device you can update it uh, by device. If you, and like we uh, said earlier, you can do it at the grub line also, uh, and, but this will be system-wide for all devices. Uh, that's not necessarily the way to do it, uh, especially in RHEL 7. Or you can use TuneD, like I mentioned. And we already have throughput performance. File systems. So main, for most part, when you use databases now, I think it's, it's kind of becoming moot 
I am mentioning here to avoid double caching by using direct I.O. and async I.O. Uh, most databases do it anyway these days. In the earlier releases and uh, with re in the rel 5 days also, there were some databases where you had to explicitly go set it. Uh, but many databases do it. I think Oracle is the only database where you still have to go and say file system I.O. options equals set all. If you don't do it, they will use cached I.O. And you don't, I mean, definitely want to avoid because they, as you know, most databases have a cache of their own and you don't want to do memory caching again. You want to access the drive directly from the database cache. Asynchronous I.O. is almost default for all databases. And if you're doing like a bulk load activity kind of thing, I wanted to just point out that there is an option uh, where you can modify your device read ahead values. So the, the command is blockdel. And you can actually go, so if you have a large device where you are getting flat files which you're loading into your database, so you want to read those flat files at a very high rate, so at a larger transfer size, you can actually go and look at the value current setting for that particular device where you store your flat files and you can up, up, update it. And the last but not the least, choosing the right file system. So I'll just share some data on that. First, let's go look at the block dev stuff. Uh, so the, here what I did was I was loading a 30 gig flat file into my DB2 database. This was a, a V9 FV4 database. Uh, and here lower is better, as the green uh, arrow indicates. The default setting for uh, read ahead was 256. Uh, this is the half, half K uh, sectors, uh, 512 byte sector. So it was set to 256. When I bumped it up to 1024, I was able to improve my load time by about 30%. Uh, just because now I was reading larger chunks of the file, so the I.O. was much faster. I was able to read the file much faster and load it into my database. So it effectively, as you guys know, when you do I.O., a larger transfer size gives you better throughput. So that's what we are doing. By changing the block device uh, read ahead, we are telling it to read bigger chunks so it reads faster and loads the data faster. Uh, choosing the right file system. So I get this question all the time, which is a better file system for running my databases. So to put it very simplistically, with the latest release for most databases, they are pretty much uh, very similar. So as you can see here, XFS was slightly underperforming. I, I got one anomaly in my run, but I included the data anyway. I was going to go and uh, rerun the stuff. Uh, I saw one at a low user count. I saw Oracle uh, on ext4 was quite better than uh, XFS. But for the most part, as you can see, they are pretty much uh, very close to each other. XFS was slightly off. For my MongoDB workloads, again, load and uh, mixed OLTP, I found that they were pretty uh, similar. Here was a case where I found that XFS actually outperformed uh, ext4 by quite a bit. If you guys are using Sybase ASC, uh, with version 15.7, I found that XFS actually significantly outperformed ext4. Uh, and I also saw that with AXC, 16, version 16, but only if you're running in the legacy mode. So in ASC 16, they actually changed their kernel mode uh, from process-based to thread-based. Thread so if you switch back to process-based uh, for, you know, for your application or for what, whatever reason, if you choose to go with the legacy mode, the old mode, actually XFS outperforms ext4. But with the, with the new setting, with the thread-based mode, actually uh, it performs almost neck to neck with XFS, and I just also included the raw data. So uh, many people ask me, why, should I use a file system for uh, Sybase or should I go with uh, raw? So here's an answer for you. Uh, database layout, now, this is very, very critical when it comes to database performance, where your files reside. I mean, uh, if it's a typical OLTP database, as you know, uh, there, there are guidelines, right? You have to separate your data files from your undo files and your logs because every single transaction goes, it gets logged as well as they create a rollback. So you have to make sure that these are separated because if they are on the same drive, you're basically saturating the drive. With DSS, uh, these are the two set of files that do the most operation, your data files and your temp files. Uh, when you're doing you know, some kind of data analysis, you're creating uh, indexes, you're sorting operations and stuff like that, you're accessing entire databases, so you want to make sure that these two files are separated from each other. And Typically, you know, you, when you're running your database workloads over time, you have to constantly analyze uh, and look at uh, your, your uh, data collection that you get from your performance tools and, and kind of figure out what needs to change in the environment. And this was the IO stat command that I was telling you about. When you use these flags, DMXZ, and you specify an interval, 
it only shows I/O for the disks that are in use. So it won't. If you have a bunch of disks on on your system, but only a few disks are active, it won't list all of them. It'll just list the uh, drives that have activity to them, and that way you can then isolate them and then decide uh, if any of those disks are under any kind of pressure. Uh, and just to kind of show the dramatic effect you can get by, by tuning your I.O. or by managing your layout. I ran this database completely in a, a fiber channel uh, setup. Then I moved my data uh, to, from my uh, fiber channel to Fusion I.O. drives, to an SSD device. So I got a nice little bump there. Once I moved my data to the Fusion I.O. drives, my entire data, here in the uh, orange one, the data was still on fiber channel. Then I moved my data to the SSD, as you can see, the effect was dramatic. So it all depends on when you look at your IOSTAT output. In fact, this will paint a better picture. This was everything on the fiber channel. And as you can see here, my drives were completely saturated. So there was no way for me to improve the performance. So I moved my logs to the, from PCI to SSD. Uh, so these are my SSD devices. And you saw that there is activity there. And it kind of relieved some of the pressure uh, from my drives. But I still saw that there is a lot of activity for my data drives. So I moved those to my SSDs. And now my SSDs were still under pressure. But I, when you looked at the numbers from the previous slide, OK, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Although my SSDs are under pressure, they, they were doing a 98%. You can see the dramatic difference in performance. From 782,000, I went to 2 million TPMs. So, so your, your database might be utilizing your drives well, but the point is you try to set it up in such a way that you, know, you want to use your drives well, but at the same time, you're not getting stuck behind any kind of you know, weight, weight events, uh, as uh, you will see in the next slide. So here, when everything was moved to the SSD, look at that. None of it is under pressure, and I'm able to really crank the system. And this paints a more compelling picture. The same, exact same database I was running on, uh, on, on the fiber channel, it was getting saturated around 150 uh, megs per second. And that is why you're seeing a ton of weight events. And this idle is actually misrepresented because uh, when you're waiting in a database, sometimes the locks tend to spin in the user space. So they, it doesn't get properly accounted. And so it looks like there is a lot of idle time. And you'll think, oh, my CPU, I have so much idle CPU. Maybe I should put more on the system. But actually, that's misleading because, uh, because of these weight events. As soon as I moved all of it to the SSD, you can see all the weight events are gone. My CPUs are being more effectively used. Everything is in the user space. There is a little bit of system activity. And look at the idle time. And the exact same database by eliminating my hotspot, I went from 150 meg per second to 400 megs per second. So, so the idea is uh, you, you want to look at these hotspots. If you see a lot of disk activity, what that means is uh, your I.O. subsystem is not capable of processing, processing the I.O. And, uh, and it, in, in the cascading effect is your database now is not able to process uh, transactions because it is waiting on IO completions. And this can also be, oh, IOSTAT is one quick way to find these kind of problems. The other is to look at your database uh, uh, AWR reports, for example, if you're using Oracle or uh, dumping uh, using SP. I forgot the name of the routine. I, I have it all scripted, so sometimes I forget, draw a blank. But uh, there are SP routines on Sybase ASC, and DB2 also has uh, tools that tell you what the uh, biggest weight events are. And if you see anything getting backed up by IO, that's, you know, uh, that's the time to consider uh, change in your IO subsystem. But that's easier said than done, right? I mean, I can tell you, yeah, you know what? Just remove all your hard drives and replace it with SSD. That's easier said than done. A lot of people have uh, a lot of investment in their traditional storage. So in order to kind of mitigate some of that pain, uh, we have introduced DM cache. And in RHEL, uh, earlier versions of RHEL, it was the tech preview in 6.5. It was supported in RHEL 7, but with 7.2, now it's become really very, very easy to implement. So if you want to actually look at the command sets on how to implement DM cache, here's the command for you. If you do a man of LVM cache, it will give you the exact information of how to go ahead and set up DM cache. And to see what kind of effect it has, here's the exact same environment. I was using my HP EVA fiber channel with LVM. 
I added the DM cache. And with my first run, you can see that the effect was not very dramatic because, oh, just to step back a little bit, what is DM cache? It, basically, you're taking a faster device and getting it to act as a cache for your legacy storage. So you already have your database and everything running on legacy storage. You take a SSD, you put it on your system, and then you tell DM cache that I want this drive to act as a cache for my slow storage. So every time your storage is accessed and, and data is being read, it will store that information on the faster device. So when you do a read or an update or activities like that, uh, it will go to the fast device. So remember, it's non-volatile. So you don't have to worry if the system crashes. You can actually, for that cache device, you can have some type of mirroring if you're concerned that, hey, what, what, hap what happens if my SSD breaks, right? So you can do that. You can have some kind of mirroring that will protect your data, will keep data integrity. But this is the kind of dramatic improvement that I saw when I added the cache. And the cache can operate in two modes. So there is write through and write back. When you're using write through, all the data that goes into your that's being written to your storage, goes through this cache, and then asynchronously gets flushed out to your uh, backend storage. But at the same time, it gives you a nice little jump in performance. And as you can see, as I do more and more I.O., and as more and more data gets cached, my performance keeps getting progressively better. So uh, at a higher user count, I was getting really nice performance. And I use the write back mode where uh, all the cache data stays on your cache device, and it gets written you know, at, at leisure. When it needs more cache, it will write the data back to your legacy storage. But uh, as, long as, if, as long as your SSD is mirrored, you don't have to worry about data integrity or data security, because those are non-volatile SSD devices, and it can give you a nice little pop in performance. And this was, when I did this, I did not have to uh, rebuild my database, or I didn't have to do anything. All I did was use LVM commands to add the cache and try to kind of cache my uh, backend storage and I was able to get this uh, improvement in performance. And to, in, if you uh, want more information, like I said in my earlier slide, man of LVM cache should give you that information. Memory tuning. Uh, so there are various aspects of memory that you want to look at when you tune. Uh, there is NUMA, there is huge pages, and uh, in the previous talk, I think if you attended Shaq and Larry's talk, you probably also saw how to manage uh, your VM. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, uh, but I will definitely talk about NUMA and huge pages, because this is, uh, crucial. So what is NUMA? Uh, as, as we see now, we see systems as they keep growing, uh, we see multi-socket systems. This is a very, very uh, small multi-socket system. I, I just tried to illustrate by this chart. I got four sockets. Each of them has got four cores, and each of them has got its own memory bank. Now, when I try to run a database, D1, D2, D3, D4, uh, all my instances are spread across all four NUMA nodes. And so every time I access, you can see those lines. Uh, ideal would be to just go local, but I'm going across NUMA nodes, and that actually Im Im adds a significant amount of overhead. This is what you want, ideally. Your databases, all nicely optimized, all with inside their NUMA nodes, so that memory access stays properly tuned, and it gives you the uh, lowest latency when you're accessing the memory. Uh, if you want to see the NUMA layout of your machine, this command will give it to you. NUMA CTL dash dash hardware. It tells you how many nodes it has, what are the CPUs on each of the nodes, and what are the, what's the memory in each of the node. This information is particularly useful if you're using, uh, for doing the NUMA alignment, if you're using some kind of NUMA CTL command or a task set command. Uh, having this information will make sure that you are picking the right CPUs uh, when you're running your workload. Uh, uh, this is the various ways you can do NUMA placement. You can use NUMA CTL, task set. You can use C groups or libvolt if you're using KVM. And here's the effect you can have from NUMA. So as you can see, uh, these are, uh, I got two instances, one without pinning and one with pinning, and likewise four instances, one with, without pinning and one with pinning. Uh, at a lower user count where there was not too, many, too much uh, cross NUMA accesses, uh, where the memory utilization was fairly low, you, you see a little bit of gain, not too much. But once you start pushing and your database, you add more processes, you start accessing more memory, clearly, NUMA pinning, uh, NUMA alignment gives you a nice jump in performance. So you can see four instances of NUMA pin is significantly better than without the proper pinning. So here's now, uh, when I talked about auto NUMA and I talked about clouds, and I said, you know, we're adding fe features to make the operating system more efficient, we added a feature called auto NUMA. And here's a quirky behavior I saw when I was running Oracle. 
So anybody who's been running Oracle, if you observe their Numa layout, when you see the, when you start up an instance, they always stripe their uh, SGA across Numa nodes. Now I don't know the exact reason why they do that. They probably do it because uh, they want consistent performance. Ideally, when you start up an instance, you want to use all the memory on one Numa node before you go to the next one, but they stripe it all across. Uh, what that does is we have the feature called Auto Numa now in RHEL 7, which looks at different processes running on a box, and then it looks at the memory it's accessing and tries to align them automatically. You don't even have to do anything. But it defeats that in Oracle, because when I was running a single instance, when I had Auto Numa on, my performance was lower than when I turned it off. But this was not noticeable because it was just about 5% less than uh, with Autonuma on. But I, as I added more instances, and because the SGA was laid across all Numa nodes, Autonuma was going in there and trying to move them around. And we saw a uh, you know, uh, fairly significant impact when I was running multiple instances. So when I ran two instances, I saw about a 10% difference. And with four instances, I saw about a 15% drop in performance when I had Autonuma on. I, when I turn it off, I get that performance back. Good news is, if you are running Oracle and you're using huge pages, you don't have to worry about it. Because with huge pages, all the memory is pinned and nothing gets moved around and you don't have to worry. But if you're not using huge pages, because uh, a lot of people, I, how many people use automatic memory management in Oracle? Good, then you should all use, oh, we got one candidate. But if you're not using autom automatic memory management, then you should be using huge pages. Because that is the only situation where Oracle tells you, if you want to use all auto memory management, turn off huge pages. So uh, use huge pages, it will really help performance and Autonuma won't affect uh, the behavior of your database. But just in case you're using auto memory management and don't want to use huge pages, I've listed the command here. This is how you turn off Autonuma. You echo zero to Numa balancing, and it will stop the Autonuma correction, and your database will perform great. But why did we put Autonuma in the first place? Here's a really good example. Uh, these are one VM, two VM, and four VMs running the same Oracle workload in each of, each of them. Now, when my Numa balancing was turned off, Autonuma off, you can see when I was really pressurizing the system, my performance actually went down. Because now, all of a sudden, my, yeah, did you have a question? Yes, if you use, I mean, you can manually pin, even if you're using huge pages, you can manually pin to optimize Numa, nothing wrong with that, but you don't have to worry about the order Numa. The OS won't move anything around, so it will use the huge pages and, you know, things will, uh, um, you won't see any degradation, so that's the key, if you're using huge pages for databases. So but this was the reason why we added order Numa, so you can see with one VM running the database, I got about 5% uh, improvement, uh, with two VMs also, I saw some significant improvement. But when I add more VMs, now Autonuma really does a great job of aligning the memory for each VM with its process to run in its own Numa node. So when I add more users, when I add more pressure, everything, because they stay in their own Numa node, you get a really nice jump in performance. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say jump in performance. It optimizes performance. So you don't get a loss in performance just in case there is a lot of cross Numa traffic. Uh, huge pages, this is what I was talking about. So traditional huge pages, uh, so we have something called as transparent huge pages, but you cannot use them for databases because databases use something called as system five shared memory. So in that case, you actually have to set up traditional huge pages in order to run databases. So the advantages of using traditional huge pages are that instead of using a 4K page, we use a two meg page. So every time you load the information into your memory, it's loaded in two meg chunks. Uh, so the page information, the page table, is 500 times smaller. So accessing the page or you know, looking up the page is far more efficient, as well as traditional huge pages are always pinned, like I just mentioned. So Autonuma doesn't affect it, and neither do those pages get swapped. So if you're running some database instance like Sybase or DB2 or Oracle, if you're using huge pages, they will be permanently pinned. So it doesn't matter if some rogue process in your system suddenly takes over a lot of memory your database pages will never be swapped. That shared memory segment will always stay pinned in memory, and that way your users can continue to access it, and you won't see any drop in performance. So that is one really compelling reason why you should be using huge pages. And like I mentioned here, transparent huge pages, we started, introduced it in RHEL 6, but it cannot be used for database. And here's how you set it up. 
if you want to do it from the command line. And here's the dramatic difference you see when you turn on huge pages. So with, uh, I did uh, one, two, and four database runs, and I started with a small user count and a max user count. And you can see with a small user count, I saw about seven to eight percent, so that was kind of a single instance, that's all I saw. But as I add more databases, and they are all pinned in memory, now my user process and processes can come and go as they please. But my database stays pinned, and I see a really nice jump in performance. So you can see I've tried to highlight that from anywhere from 8 to 15%, and with four instances, anywhere from 10 to 20% improvement in performance by using huge pages. Uh, same thing with uh, VMs. When I do huge pages, and I do huge pages inside the virtual machine too, I see uh, improvement that jumps between 1 to 8% uh, with a single VM, but with four VMs, I see dramatic improvement in performance. So, Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is you should use huge pages for your databases. Uh, flushing catcher, caches. So this uh, Larry mentioned uh, during his talk. Uh, basically, you can, when you run uh, an application like a backup, uh, you notice that uh, uh, Linux tends to use all the memory that's available to it. And the reason is very simple. Uh, cost of accessing memory is much lower than cost of doing an I.O. So when you do a backup, for example, you're backing up your uh, database onto tapes, all of that information stays in the file cache. But after you're done with your backups, you want to release that memory so that you know as new user connections come in, uh, they have free memory, they don't have to do the uh, free table lookup. Uh, you can actually flush that by dropping caches. So you can free up all that page cache by echoing one, or you can free up the slab cache, or you can do that simultaneously by echoing three to the drop caches uh, file in your proc subsystem. Uh, there, is, there was a command called, uh, there is a parameter called swappiness. Many people actually see this in uh, certain database uh, install guides, and they tell you to lower the value of swappiness. They say uh, the default is 60. They say that's too aggressive. Lower it down to zero. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore, because starting from rel 6, we actually now maintain two LRUs, uh, one for the anonymous pages and one for uh, kernel pages and for process pages. So because there are two LRUs, memory management is much more efficient. So your data page, database pages are never put on the LRU till there is a lot of memory pressure. So they tend to stay there. So you don't have to worry about it. And you don't have to change the value, value of swappiness. Question? Uh, for rel 6, also, you don't have to do that. You don't have to change swappiness. Yeah, I mean, if you do it, there is no harm, because actually, I tried to explain what swappiness is doing um, in this slide. When you decrease it, you're basically telling your OS to aggressively reclaim any free pages that it can find, so that there is free pay, you know, your free list stays populated. Uh, so decreasing it is not going to really kill your performance, but it's not one of those things that, you know, you really have to change now, because the way we now, starting with RHEL 6, we changed the LRU the way it is processed, so you don't have to change it. If you do, there is, uh, I don't think there is any detriment to performance. I just wanted to kind of point out, let, people ask me about swappiness and they say, what, what's its function and what is, what is it doing? So that's the reason why I included that. Does that answer your question? Or maybe we can talk afterwards uh, if there is, you know, you need more clarification. Uh, so this is the VM dirty background ratio. Again, when you're running database workloads and you're doing some, uh, uh, other user processes are doing other activities on the system. There are, at times, people say that, you know, my system behaves sluggish. Uh, there are points where I see these small hiccups where the system is not doing anything and then everything frees up and it starts running normally. That's typically when you hit these thresholds. Uh, when you're filling up your memory uh, with, when blocks are being modified by external processes other than the database, uh, there is something called as a dirty background ratio. So as your memory fills up, it reaches the 10% of RAM dirty. There is a demon which wakes up, and it's a background demon. So it, it starts flushing the dirty pages. It starts cleaning them up. But if you are dirtying pages at a very rapid rate outside your database, you will hit this threshold, which is set to 20% by default. And what happens is once you reach that threshold, literally everything stops till the threshold, I mean, till the system is able to flush the dirty pages and get that value be below 20%. And that is a hiccup that you experience because it practically stops all processing in order to do this. So the way to get around this problem, if you see this on your system time and again, is to 
increase this gap. So you can either lower this, so you can have the background demon wake up earlier, or you can raise this a little bit, and you can, that way you can give it a little extra time so that the background flushing can happen. Like I said, it, this, this area is good. This is where you want to be. You know, flush the writing dirty buffers in the background. So it continues to do the processing, and it does not stop or, or you know, uh, bring your system down to its knees. Uh, hyper, hyper thread. So now let's go to the CPU. So we talked about I.O. performance, we talked about NUMA, and we talked about huge pages. So for CPU, uh, one of the biggest factors is hyper threads. Now we've got uh, cores with multiple sockets, and now Intel's also enabled hyper thread. So how do you take advantage of this hyper thread? And does, does it really help performance? I mean, you know, anything hyper has to be good, right? That's what at least we assume. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I've, I've kind of written these sentences here, so you can, these slides are available for download, so you can read them. But the gist of this is, if your application itself, uh, a database application, for example, a transactional workload, uh, they don't tend to scale really well as you add more CPUs, because you, know, you get all these processes distributed across these CPUs, they try to come in and modify data sets, and they lock each other up. You get into deadlock situations. So sometimes you find that uh, transactional workloads tend to work efficiently up to a certain point, and after that, they kind of tail off. I, I don't know if you've observed this phenomena, and we, because we do this measurement all the time, we see they reach a certain point, and they kind of tail off. In that situation, really ha adding more CPUs by enabling hyperthreads is not going to help it. But if you're running multiple applications on the same box, and by using proper NUMA, you can actually get a nice little pop uh, by using hyperthreads. And here's a chart that shows it. So quick explanation. I've got one node with no hyperthreads and hyperthreads, two nodes, three nodes, and four nodes. Here's the chart one, two, then the blue is three, and this is four. What I noticed was if I do proper alignment, a single node where I enable hyperthread, it gives me the best performance boost. And the reason for that is each CPU, as you know, has its own cache. Each socket has its cache. When you enable hyperthreads, you know, you've got more processes taking advantage of that cache. So when you're running things within that single node, it, it actually helps performance quite a bit. But as you start scaling, now you've got so many CPUs trying to do activity in the CPU cache, there can be a process running on CPU 2, but the data it requires might, might be in the cache of CPU 1. When I say CPU, I mean the socket. So now, it kind of hinders scaling. So you kind of get the picture. So hyperthreading is good, but for a single large monolithic application, it might not benefit. So when I pushed that database across four nodes, all I got was 5% improvement by turning on hyperthreads. So what was the takeaway from this? That if you keep things within the NUMA nodes, you get the maximum benefit. And this one actually shows that. So when I had four instances, with hyperthread and without hyperthread, I aligned them properly in their NUMA nodes. You can see, by enabling hyperthread, I got a 50% improvement in performance. So that is the whole takeaway, that just by enabling hyperthreads, you are not necessarily going to scale because of the CPU caches, and by adding more processes and having them run all over the place and trying to contend for the information in the CPU cache, you're not going to improve performance. You can do it by, by aligning NUMA and having all of these processes running within that socket and taking advantage of the CPU cache. Uh, and same thing noticed with the KVM. When I use multi-KVMs, uh, one VM really did not benefit from hyperthreads at all. Uh, that is hyperthread with 32 vCPUs and 64 vCPUs. Uh, but when I added hyperthreads and I started doing proper NUMA alignment with my VMs, I got a nice pop in performance. So this was when I turned on even without increasing the number of vCPUs in my VM. I, all I did was I turned on the hyperthreads in my host and left my VCU, vCPUs at 32 vCPUs per uh, VM. Uh, not per VM, but total of 32 vCPUs. Uh, I still got a nice jump in performance. From Starting from the red, I got a 36% improvement. But when I increased the number of vCPUs to match the host, now that I turned on hyperthreads, I have double the number of CPUs. When I turned that on, I was able to get a 60% improvement in performance. So yes, hyperthreads definitely help, but it's very application dependent, and if you're running multiple instances, uh, if you take advantage of NUMA, you'll definitely see a really nice jump in performance. Network tuning, so I'm going a little fast here. Uh, hopefully, you know, if there are any other unanswered questions or things that uh, is on your mind, we can continue our discussions in the, in the uh, birds of a feather session. But one of the things I want to point out with network uh, tuning is, 
you have to turn on ARP filter. So one of the things about uh, uh, the address resolution pro protocol or ARP is that if you've got two hosts connected with a public network and a private network, if at some point your private network, so for example, if you're using the private network for cache fusion in Oracle especially, uh, if, if there is a lot of traffic on your private network, it can actually start routing traffic over the public network. It doesn't matter if they are on different subnets. This is called the ARP flux. It is there in Linux. It was designed as a feature to kind of help out in case one network is flooded. But in, in these situations where you're intentionally setting up private network and public network, uh, that, that feature can actually defeat the whole purpose of setting up two networks. So if you want to take, you know, uh, you want, you're setting up private network and you want all that traffic to stay on that, you have to set up our filters by doing this. It's a one-time thing. You can put it in your sysctl.conf, and it will make sure that your traffic does not get mixed up. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, for network tuning. Uh, it, in in RHEL 6, we support RDMA. So if your database applications support RDMA, take advantage of that. Uh, but there are not too many that do at the moment. Uh, but this definitely helps in tuning. So you can actually use jumbo frames uh, for, for databases where you're doing I.O. or you're doing uh, your block sizes are about 4 or 8K. This definitely helps in performance. I just included this line here. This is the tool that I use to monitor uh, my network traffic. But here's an example. Uh, I did this experiment with iSCSI storage. So now more and more people are switching to network-based storage, to, to NAS. And if you're using NAS, that's a perfect candidate for looking at jumbo frames. Because in this OLTP workload, you can see I'm running with 1500, which is the default MTU size. And I switch it to 9000. I don't see much of a gain because in an OLTP workload, uh, when I looked at my SAR output, my request sizes were mostly, you know, uh, 1,500, 1, 1K, 2K range. So it fit perfectly in the 1500 MTU. But when I was doing a DSS workload, a decision support workload, when I was doing analysis and trying to access large chunks of data, that's when using a larger frame size tremendously improved my performance. Uh, in fact, this is, I'm measuring completion time. Uh, no, this is the metric that was used to calculate my uh, total value of my analysis. And as, as you can see, it was like three to four times faster. And you can see that same dramatic effect in the output of SAR. So when I did that exact same workload with the 1500 MTU, this was the best I could get because the time it takes to process those network packets and put it over the wire, that was the best I could get because of the request size. So you can see the number of uh, packets and the total transmission. When I just change the frame size, you can see the difference in transmission. So frame sizes, especially in network-based storage, jumbo frames can make a big effect. So take a look at your I.O. Uh, request size. Uh, you can use uh, I.O. stat also for that if you're using NAS. And take a look at the request size. If the request sizes are about 2K, anywhere in the 4K to 8K range, by switching your frames, you can get a nice improvement in performance for network storage. Uh, and in, last but not the least, when you are running databases, a lot of people uh, set up their databases for a lot of resiliency. Uh, remember, resiliency is not a friend of performance. That's why I put that in red. Uh, because when you, when you optimize your database, you have to look at uh, the design itself. But design is a factor of various business rules. There's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, you can reduce some locking and waiting by looking at the lock events and figuring out, hey, do I need to really add an index here, or do I need to take out an index because my inserts are going slow? Uh, and if you use database tools, you can opt, uh, optimize it regularly. But if you, put, if, if you are uh, overly paranoid and you put too much resiliency into a system, that can have a dramatic effect on performance. And this is why I wanted to share the Oracle information, because I know a lot of you use Oracle, uh, by using multiplex. So now we put all kinds of resiliency into our storage, uh, you know, uh, RAID 6 and additional battery backup and all that stuff. And then we go ahead and we multiplex our logs also, like three or four multiplexes. You can see the uh, effect it has on performance. So here's a three multiplex, the uh, blue line. Uh, the orange is two multiplex and without multiplex. So now obviously you don't want to use no multiplex at all if you are concerned about data safety. But what I wanted to show was every time I add a multiplex, I lose performance. So I get the best performance without multiplex, but as I add multiplex, I start losing performance. So if you are spending money to make sure your data subsystems are uh, pretty resilient and uh, your hosts are, have all kinds of RAS features, then you could probably scale back on how much you multiplex your logs. 
the other thing was, in the olden days, when, uh, when you uh, created the Oracle database, the log size, uh, recommended size was uh, half a gig or one gig. Uh, that was because the storage subsystems used to be really slow. Uh, the recovery time on databases, when your database crashed, it would do it sequentially. And so you, uh, it was a trade-off. Do you want to spend a lot of time recovering, or do you want to be safe and then spend very little time recovering in, in case there is a crash? And so people would size their logs really small. So we did an experiment where we started off with one gig logs in the light blue bar, and we went all the way up to 32 gig logs. And as you can see, there is a dramatic improve improvement in performance. Uh, with the, with the larger log files, because you're doing lesser log switches, uh, and because of that, you're not doing data flushes. So all of that activity really speeds up. But at what cost? I mean, you'll say, oh, that's all that is good, but then what happens if my system crashes? How much time will it take to recover? So we actually measured that as well. So with 32 gig log, it took the longest time to recover. It took about 10 minutes. And with a one gig log, it took the least amount of time to recover. Now, this was the worst case scenario which we designed. We, we made sure that the log switch had not taken place, and we pulled the plug on the database, and we watched the recovery. Uh, it, that might not happen each and every time, but a good place to be might be here. You know, bump up your log files from one gig to maybe four gigs, so you almost double your performance, and your recovery time is also within a reasonable rate. So, basically, you know, that, that should be the approach when you look, look at trying to tune your database. Uh, C groups. So with RHEL 6, we introduced a concept called C groups, which allows you to manage your resources. And my whole take on this is, if your system is well managed, you get good performance. So I, I consider using C groups uh, to manage multiple instances as a good way to tune your system to make sure that your databases are always performant. Uh, here's an example of uh, using C groups. Uh, when I did not use any resource control, so for example, if you have uh, a single host, supporting various business groups, and certain business groups have a higher demand, uh, compute demand, than others. And you are running all of it on the same host. If you leave them all to run without any control, uh, resource control, they'll all pretty much take equal resources. But you can actually do this and, and provide good performance to business units that need it, and, and, uh, and limit the resources that are available to other business units that don't need it. Uh, so that way, you know, if, if there is uh, somebody, some business unit that runs a big query at some time, and instead of you know, pretty much bringing everybody to a halt, you are telling them that this is all you'll get for resources, and that is the best performance you'll get. So kind of establishing a quality of service, and thereby assuring that you know, the mission-critical uh, databases always run at the top speed. Uh, you can use C groups to manage NUMA. We don't need to spend time on this because we already saw the benefits of using NUMA, but C groups just makes it easier to manage NUMA. Instead of using NUMA CTL commands and things like that, once you define your C groups for your instances, Every time you start up the instance, it will automatically go in the proper C group, and it will properly run in the correct NUMA node. So it's a very efficient way to do NUMA uh, optimization. Uh, one really good advantage of C groups is it's all, it's all dynamic. Once you define a C group and you put a database in a C group, you can increase the number of resources, or you can decrease it. So for example, if you had a month-end activity, I know a lot of DBAs face this challenge that oh, on a month-end activity, we need more resources for a particular database. Uh, how do we do that without you know, we don't want to stop other databases, but at the same time, we want to make sure that this guy gets the most resources. If you're running in C groups, you can just bump up the number of CPUs for that database. You can see here, it dynamically goes up. The performance just goes up because it gets more resources to do the compute jobs. And, and you can do application isolation. So this, again, goes back to the previous uh, uh, thought process that I shared with you, that if you have some rogue applications that can really damage your performance, but if you're using C groups to manage your resources properly, you can isolate each instance or each database, and that, that way you can make sure that there are no rogue instances that can bring your system down to its knees. So here, actually, my system is swapping because I limited the resources for one database, but you can see the other three databases do not uh, suffer the consequences of, uh, of swapping. This swapping is happening only for this particular instance. So, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, I'll quickly touch upon certain things. I, I know I'm going a little fast, but uh, I, I've tried to make these slides as, as you know, readable as possible. So, and after that, we can always have more discussions uh, uh, if we need to. Uh, on virtualization, again, we should take advantage of, uh, uh, we have a tuning option where you can turn off the cache. So instead of putting pressure on your host file cache, 
we should use advantage, you take advantage of the memory inside your virtual machines and turn off caching at your host. Uh, and you can clearly see here, uh, with increased user count, turning cache off gives you a nice jump in performance. NUMA, again, I keep impressing this uh, NUMA thing because as systems get larger, uh, NUMA optimization really makes a big difference in performance. Uh, transparent huge pages. So transparent huge pages actually kick in big time when you're using virtualization because your virtual machines can actually use the transparent huge pages. And there are some ways to optimize it. Uh, the way transparent huge pages work is they, they coalesce smaller pages into these huge pages. But when you're doing activity, sometimes these bigger pages can break down and that can have an effect on performance. So you can actually, there is a uh, parameter which you can control the scan rate. So if you actually change the scan rate from 10,000, which is the default to 100, I actually got a nice jump in performance and it actually matched uh, my performance with traditional huge pages. So you can actually control the behavior of, behavior of transparent huge pages in your virtual environment and improve performance of your uh, workloads if you're running them in virtual machines. And KSM, so another feature in uh, Rev is KSM. And when you look at the flag, it, it promises to take you to some like, you know, <laughs> uh, perfect land where you can get all that extra memory that you can use and you can uh, overcome it and all those things. Not your friend on Linux. If you're using Windows, use KSM. If you're using Linux, you can see every time I have KSM on, my performance takes a hit. When I turn it off and I do THP scan rate uh, tuning, I get the best performance. So KSM is basically, it's called kernel same page merging. So it looks for opportunities to merge the memory into, coalesce the memory into fewer number of pages. It's not your friend on Linux because li Linux tends to use all the memory that's provided to it. And it has very little potential for page merging. Uh, and in migration, there is a, a setting called migration max bandwidth. I just wanted to throw it in there. If you are doing migration of VMs and you're running a database workload, the default setting is not enough to facilitate migration. So you can see this red line where I was trying to migrate my database. It was running in a degraded mode because my migration default bandwidth was very low. And it, this, this is counterintuitive. I actually set it to zero. Basically, when you set it to zero, you're telling it to use unlimited bandwidth, whatever is available to it. And you can see my yellow line. It dropped, my performance dropped, but as soon as my migration was complete, my performance went right back to where it was. So the blue line is without migration. So migration, max migration bandwidth, in case you are using KVM, uh, make sure that you go set it in this file uh, so that if, if at any point you need to migration your uh, virtual machines, uh, it, it will, it will uh, demonstrate this behavior where the migration will complete very quickly and your performance will go back to the original level. Uh, network tuning for virtualization, we actually have WordIO, uh, which is the default drivers, but we actually provide facilities to do a PCI pass-through and a sing, uh, single root IO virtualization where you can pass your PCI devices into your virtual machine and get almost bare metal performance. So if you are running uh, network-based storage and you're running inside a virtual machine, then you want to take advantage of these features. PCI uh, pass-through or single root uh, IO, uh, SRIOV. It is supported only on limited hardware. It's not supported on all, uh, but I think more and more uh, network cards now support uh, SRIOV. And last but not the least, uh, some tools. Uh, for most of my testing, I use these tools. I shared the output with you guys when I showed you the ways to identify performance issues. Uh, with SAR, uh, we looked at VMstat output. We also looked at IOstat output. Uh, there are a bunch of kernel tools. These, typically, you don't have to use on a day-to-day -day basis, but they can be useful if you ever get into a situation which needs debugging and you need somebody from Red Hat to take a look at uh, the output. For networking, we, I typically use uh, eTool and ifconfig to look at my frame sizes. And there are a bunch of tools that we provide now uh, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux that helps you profile your workload. So one of the tools that's my favorite now is called Perf. Uh, it's an analysis tool, it's dynamic. You can run Perf top and see the top processes that are doing activity in your system. But you can also use an option called record and report so you can actually save if, if you encounter certain times of bad performance, you can actually run Perf record and record it off to a file and then do a report afterwards. So you don't have to do it dynamically while things are going on because you may not have time to sit there and monitor it. So record it 
and then do the report feature so you can take a look at it. I'll show you the output in a second. Or if you are now starting to test a new application, you can actually run perf stat and use that command, the new application. You can run it inside, encapsulate it in this perf, and it will collect all the statistics while that application is running. So I'll, some examples. Uh, this is the output of perf top. So when I'm running Oracle, as you can see, these are all Oracle routines. And it shows me which are the top routines. And if you start seeing, I mean, page faults are common, but if you start seeing spin locks go up there, that means it's time to take a look, closer look at your application. Because uh, if, if it's constantly spinning or waiting on something, that means either the application is locking too much on, on certain activities. You can find that out by looking at your wait events. Or IO might be a problem. Remember, we looked at the IO output when we moved from fiber channel to uh, SSD. So uh, that might be a problem. So you will, that will manifest as a, as a spin lock, and it will bubble to the top. This is an output of perf record and report. Again, exact same output, but done in a staggered way. I did a record, and then I ran a report, and I got the same exact same output. And as you can see, this was running uh, fairly well. I don't see any spin lock. I see all uh, nice Oracle routines. Uh, this one was the one I was telling you about, the perf stat. So when I ran this command uh, to run my database workload with regular 4K pages, I was able to get all of these statistics from that run and pay attention to the page faults. Uh, so when I ran this with 4K pages, I got 1,621,000 uh, page faults. And when I switched to two meg pages, my page faults went down by 300,000. So that is a nice 15% improvement in performance, which you saw when you run huge pages. So when perf, perf can actually give you a lot of information. I know, I mean, you know, uh, it's easier for me because I know exactly what I was looking for. Sometimes when you generate a huge report, uh, it's hard to kind of uh, find exactly what you're looking for. But you know, running it in two different scenarios and running a diff command can help you better analyze certain uh, performance issues. Uh, and SAR, this I, I shared this uh, with you, changing the frame size. So uh, we already looked at this data. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, from my side, I think, you know, uh, I.O. choose the proper el uh, elevator, eliminate hotspots, direct I.O., async I.O. When it comes to virtualization, avoid caching. In memory, pay attention to your NUMA alignment, which will uh, benefit you even in terms of hyperthreads, when you enable hyperthreads. Uh, use huge pages uh, so that you will avoid swapping. Uh, keep an eye on swapping if you, if you are generating VM stats regularly. Uh, and managing caches. You know, if you drop your caches, uh, new user connections can, can come into the system far more easily uh, because free lists are available to them. And uh, CPU, yeah, CPU speed settings. Using TuneD, if you want better performance, look at using the latency performance profile and maxing your CPU uh, uh, frequency. <laughs> uh, I kind of... Uh, Lost my stream of thought there. And then if for networks, uh, look at uh, using the proper packet size. And also, don't forget to turn off ARP filter. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if, uh, if there is any feedback, please go ahead and post comments. I mean, every year I get a uh, nice feedback from a lot of my uh, attendees. And I use that to kind of refine my slides so that it makes more and more sense for you guys. Uh, and I guess that's it. Other than that, thank you very much for attending the session. And if you're interested in Q&A, uh, you can wait. Otherwise, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for joining. And you can also, anybody who's interested in continuing the discussion, uh, we will see you in room 206. Uh, we have beer, and we have a lot of experts uh, who will be drinking beer along with you. So it should be a fun discussion. Uh, yeah, uh, your question? So are we still on? Yeah. So the question was, have we done benchmarking between uh, bare metal and virtualization? Yes, we have. Uh, virtualization incurs a penalty about uh, anywhere from 5 to 15%, uh, depending on what, you're, what activity you're trying to do. If it's a lot of CPU activity, memory activity, the overhead is not that bad. But when you're doing I.O., because you have to do a handoff between the hypervisor, uh, unless you're using something like SRIOV. If you're using SRI, I mean, for example, if I'm running to a NAS, and I use SRIOV, then I almost get bare metal performance. 
and then the difference is smaller. But yes, there is, a, there is definitely a cost of virtualization. One of the cool things is now you, uh, I don't know how many people attended the session on containers. Containers have very, very little overhead. You can't migrate containers, so there are features in virtualization that are still beneficial from a overall, you know, using it in a cloud environment type of scenario. But containers have very, very little overhead, uh, and they almost run at bare metal speeds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they will be posted. I think, and because we are recording the video, you will also find a video of this session. So for some of the explanation, you can probably scroll through the slides and listen to what I was saying on the stage. All right? Uh, for VMware, you cannot do the NUMA tuning manually, but apparently VMware themselves do a really good job of NUMA optimization, NUMA alignment. So uh, within the guest, and again, you can't also turn off the IO caching because that's, again, completely VMware, but you can set up the profiles. I think, in fact, VMware also now uses our virtual guest profile in their VM. If they're not, you can go turn it on. So you can set up TuneD and say, use the virtual guest profile, and that will give you uh, you know, performance benefits of running inside a virtual machine. Specifically for VMware, I have not. No, because we do, I mean, VMware licenses are expensive, and uh, we tried to set up some in our, uh, in our office, and uh, unfortunately, we are, because of the agreement, we are not even allowed to publish and share information uh, that we run on VMware, so it kind of becomes a catch-22 for us, so we stopped doing that. But if there are situations where customers actually encounter performance issues, then we take a look at it. You know, because now it come, falls within the rel support realm. So now we can tell them, oh yeah, when I look at the VM stat output, hey, maybe you are, you have too many devices on, on a single, uh, you know, shared storage. Maybe you need to eliminate some of that hotspot, some something like that. Right? Yes. Yeah, and, and the advantage of TuneD is you can set a profile. If you think that it's not benefiting or you would rather stay at where you were, you can roll it right back. It is dynamic. You can simply say TuneD profile. And uh, in fact, funny enough, I was talking to one customer and they didn't have any profile set up. He went back and he used the throughput performance profile. And even within VMware, this was rel 6. It changed the pro, uh, uh, IO scheduler from uh, CFQ to deadline. He got a 20% improvement. He, just, he was so excited. He went out, and then within 15 minutes, he said, I saw a 20% improvement in performance. So yes, and, and you can roll it right back if you don't, don't see the performance benefits that you were expecting. 